and what you're up to. Well, we want to make production a dominant force in getting good sales. Sales which will fit both the client's needs and the plant's capabilities like a glove. Exactly as we did in Burnside's case. But you see, for that I have to be here in the plant. As long as we don't understand it in full, as long as we don't develop the new procedures, we have to be intimately involved with all the details. So what you want to do is to find those procedures. I see. This is interesting, but Bob, that's not like you. Since when have you been interested in such things? Well, since you came and forced us to rethink the way we were doing stuff. Do you think somebody needs better proof than what's happened here in the past months? I mean, here we were, running things like we'd always done it, by the seat of our pants, slowly but surely sinking. And then we took the time and re-examined it from basic principles. And look at how many sacred cows we've had to slaughter. Worker efficiency? Whoops! Out the window. Optimum batch sizes? There it goes. Releasing work just because we have the material and the people? That's gone as well, and I could go on and on. But look at the result. If I hadn't seen it myself, I wouldn't believe it. Yeah, Alex... I want to stay here and continue what you've started. I want to be the new plant manager. You caused us to change almost every rule in production. You forced us to view production as a means to satisfy sales. I want to change the role production is playing in getting sales. Fine with me. But, Bob, when you nail those procedures, if, will you consider taking on responsibility for all the plants in the division? <laughs> you bet, boss. I'll teach them a trick or two. Let's drink to it. Hey. Who do you suggest should take your place? Frankly, I'm not impressed with any of your superintendents. Unfortunately, I agree with you. The best would be Stacy, but I don't give it much chance she'd take it. Why don't we ask her? You know what? Let's call both Stacy and Ralph in and discuss your idea. So, at last you found him. Yes, Stacy. And it definitely looks like a promising idea. But before that... There's another thing that we'd like to discuss with you. We've just agreed that Bob will take my place as plant manager. How about you taking his place as production manager? Congratulations, hey, congratulations Bob. Congratulations, Thanks. That's no surprise. Stacy hasn't answered my question. Think about it. You don't have to answer now. We know that you love your job and that you don't want the burden of all the personnel problems that go with being a production manager. But we both think that you'd do a fantastic job. Yeah, you bet. Last night, I was lying in bed praying. I was praying that this job would be offered to me. Hey, done. Now that you've accepted, can you tell us why you want this job so badly? It looks like being a material manager is starting to be boring around this plant. Not enough expediting, not enough rush calls. I didn't know that you liked that type of excitement. No, I didn't, and I don't. That's why I was so happy with our new method, timing the release of material according to the bottleneck's consumption. But you know my fear. What happens if new bottlenecks pop up? What my people and I have done is to examine daily the cues in front of the assembly and in front of the bottlenecks. We call them buffers. We check just to be sure that everything that's scheduled to be worked on is there, that there are no holes. We thought that if a new bottleneck pops up, it would immediately show up as a hole in at least one of these buffers. It took us some time to perfect this technique, but now it's working smoothly. You see, whenever there's a hole in a buffer, and I'm not talking about just the work that's supposed to be done on a given day, but the work for two or three days down the road, we go and check in which work center the materials are stuck. And then... And then you expedite. No, nothing of the sort. We don't break setups or light a fire. We just point out to the foreman of that work center which job we would prefer he gets to next. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it became even more interesting when we realized that we were visiting the same six or seven work centers every time. They're not bottlenecks, but the sequence in which they perform their jobs became very important. We call them Capacity Constraint Resources, CCR for short. Yeah, I know all about it. Those foremen have become almost dependent on your people to prioritize their work. But, Stacy, you're not answering our question. I'm coming to it. See, these holes have become more and more dangerous lately sometimes to the extent that assembly has to deviate significantly from their scheduled sequence. And it's become apparent that the foremen of the CCRs have more and more difficulty supplying on time. 
Ralph was telling me that these work centers still have enough capacity, and maybe on the average he's right. But I'm afraid that any additional increase in sales will throw us into chaos. So here's a bomb ticking below our feet, and I didn't even realize it. I'm pressing so hard on marketing to bring more sales, and according to what Stacy's just revealed, that might blow up the whole plant. Don't you realize that we've concentrated our improvement efforts too narrowly? We tried so hard to improve our bottlenecks, when what we should do is improve the CCRs as well. Otherwise, we'll run into an interactive bottleneck situation. See, the key is not in the hands of the materials people. If interactive bottlenecks emerge, chaos is inevitable. We'll have to expedite all over the place. So, what are you suggesting? The key is in the hands of production. These techniques to manage the buffers should not be used just to track missing parts while there's still time. They should be used mainly to focus our local improvement efforts. We must guarantee that the improvements on the CCRs will always be sufficient to prevent them from becoming bottlenecks. Alex, Bob, that's why I want this job so badly. I want to make sure that the material manager's job will continue to be boring. I want to demonstrate how local improvements should be managed, and I want to show all of you how much more throughput we can squeeze from the same resources. What about you, Ralph? It's your turn to surprise me. What do you mean? It looks like everyone around here has a pet project. What ace are you hiding up your sleeve? No aces, just a wish. Well, well, I've started to like my job. I feel like I'm part of a team. Yep. It's not just me and the computer anymore, trying to fiddle with inaccurate or untimely data. People really need me now, and I feel like I'm contributing. But you know what? I think that the change, at least as it relates to my function, is very fundamental. What I'm holding in my files is data. What you're usually asking for is information. I always regarded information as those sections of the data which are needed in order to make a decision. And for that, let me admit it, for most decisions, my data was simply unsuitable. Remember the time we were trying to find the bottlenecks? It took me four days to admit that I simply couldn't find the answer. What I started to realize is that information is something else. Information is the answer to the question asked. The more I'm able to do it, the more a part of the team I become. This bottleneck concept has really helped me to move along these lines. Let's face it, today the plant obeys a schedule that's released from the computer. What's my wish, you ask? I want to develop a system that'll help in what Bob wants to do, that will shrink drastically the time and effort needed to engineer a sale, as he calls it. I want to develop a system to help Stacy manage the buffers, and even to help in managing the local improvements. I want to develop a system to help Lou measure, in a much more beneficial way, the local performance. You see, like everyone else, I have my dreams. Chapter 34 It's quite late. The kids are already fast asleep. Julie and I are sitting in the kitchen. We're each holding a cup of warm tea in our hands. I tell her about what happened today at the plant. She seems to be more than mildly interested. She actually claims that she finds it fascinating. I love it. Rehashing the day's events with Julie really helps me to digest it. So, what do you think? I'm starting to see what Jonah meant when he warned you about increasing the dependency. What do you mean? Well, maybe I'm wrong, but you gave me the impression that you're not too sure that Lou will be able to come up with a good new measurement system. That's right. Is a new measurement system important for you? Are you kidding? I don't know of another single thing which is as important as that. So if it weren't for Jonah's refusal to continue giving you pointed questions, am I right in assuming that you'd be on the phone right now trying to squeeze more hints from him? Most probably. It's certainly important enough. And what about Bob's idea? Do you regard that as something important? If he pulls it off, it'll be a revolution. It'll guarantee that we take a big share of the market. Definitely, our problem with getting more sales will be over. And how much hope do you have that he'll be able to do it? Mm, not much, I'm afraid. I see your point. Yeah, I would have run to Jonah with these questions as well. And the same with the issues that Stacy and Ralph have raised. Each one of them is essential. And how many more things will pop up when you start to manage the division? 
You're right, Julie, and Jonah is also right. I felt it today as well. When each one of them spelled out their immediate dream in such a tangible form, I wondered what mine is. The only thing that kept popping into my mind is that I must learn how to manage. But where on earth am I going to find the answer to Jonah's question? What are the techniques needed for management? I don't know, Julie. What do you think I should do now? All the people back at the plant owe you a lot. They're proud of you, and rightfully so. You've created quite a team. But this team is going to be broken up in two months when we go to the division. Why don't you spend the time that's left sitting with them and going over your question? They'll have ample time after you're gone to work on their problems. Anyhow, it'll be much easier for them to achieve what they want to achieve if you have the management techniques. I look at her in silence. Here is my real, true advisor. So, I've done what my advisor suggested. I gathered them all together and explained that if each of them wants to be free to concentrate on his pet project, the division must be well run. And in order for the division to be well run, the division manager must know what he's doing. And since I frankly don't have the foggiest idea of how to run a division, they'd better put their brains to helping me. Thus, we're going to devote the afternoons, provided, of course, that no special emergency comes up, to help me analyze how the division should be run. I decide to start the meeting with my most naive questions. Initially, they might think that I've lost all my self-confidence, but I must expose to them the magnitude of the problem I'm about to face. Otherwise, I'm going to end up at best with some fragmented, vague suggestions. What are the first things I should do when I assume my new position? Well, I'd start by visiting Hilton Smythe's plant. <laughs> <laughs> First, you should meet with your staff. You know most of them, but you've never worked closely with them. What's the purpose of these meetings? If this question had been asked under any other circumstances, they would have taken it as a clear indication of a total lack of managerial knowledge. As it is, they play the game. Basically, you should do general fact-finding first. You know, like where the entrance is, where the toilets are. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that meeting the people is important. Financial numbers only reveal a small fraction of the picture. You have to find out what the people think is going on. What do they see as problems? Where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis the clients? Who has a grudge against whom? And you also have to get a sense of the local politics. And then? And then I'd uh, probably take a tour of the various production facilities, visit some of the big clients, and probably even some suppliers. you got to get the full picture. And then? But, but then and you then take you'll it take from it there. from there. <laughs> How easy it is to give advice when the responsibility is on someone else's shoulders. Okay, wise guys, it's time to turn the table. Yes, what you've suggested just now is the usual line of action one takes when he's told to go there and fix it. Let me play it back for you, but in a more schematic way. Where are the colored markers? I grab a red marker and turn to the white board. The first step, as you've all pointed out, is fact-finding. I hold a staff meeting, and what do I find? Oh, here we find fact A. I draw a nice red circle. And here are three somewhat smaller circles. And here is a tiny one. Oh, and there are two which are overlapping. Now... Let's talk with another manager. This is very helpful. You see, this circle, he claims, is not as big as we were led to believe. And here, in the left upper corner, are two more biggies. Now, someone else reveals to us that some rectangles exist. We check, and yes, he's right. Here there is one, and here, and here, and here. We're making progress. The picture starts to unfold. What they actually see is how the white board is getting the measles. It looks like one of the drawings my kids used to bring home from kindergarten. I don't think they got the message. They just seem confused. I decide to continue a little more bluntly. It's about time to talk with another manager. We must get a sense of the local politics. Oh, this is very interesting. There are also green circles and even some green stars. Here's an unidentified shape. Never mind, we'll address it later. Now... Let's tour the production facilities, visit clients, and even some suppliers. We're bound to reveal many more interesting facts. As I talk, the board is filled with overlapping shapes. Now that we have the full picture, we can take it from here. I finally conclude and put the markers down. Well, the board looks like a nightmare in Technicolor. 
I take a deep breath and pick up the phone to order more coffee. Nobody says a word. Not even Bob. Let's make it less personal. Suppose that we are a committee that's been given the ungrateful task of find out what's going on. How do you suggest we should start? They all smile, somehow pretending that we're a committee makes us feel much better. The safety of being part of a herd. The blame will not be aimed at anyone in particular. Ralph, will you volunteer to describe the committee's actions? Well, they would probably start in the same way, fact-finding. And as you so vividly demonstrated, they would end up in the same colorful ditch. But Alex, is there any other way to start? How can you do anything sensible without knowing what's going on, without having the data? Ralph is true to his profession. For him, knowing what's going on is equivalent to having the data neatly stored in his computer files. You call this mess knowing what's going on? Oh, Alex, come on. We all know that this nonsense of fact-finding will continue until our committee runs out of ideas for gathering further facts. Or they run out of time. Yeah, of course. What do you think that we acting as a committee would do next? We know a committee can't submit this mess. <laughs> <laughs> they finally started to realize the problem that I'm facing. What are they going to do now? They'll probably try to arrange this monstrous pile of facts in some order. Most likely. Sooner or later, one of the committee members will suggest organizing the shapes according to their relative size. Oh, I don't think so. Determining the relative size of different shapes is quite difficult. They'll probably decide to organize them according uh, to the type of shapes. They can arrange the data by circles, rectangles, and stars. What are they going to do with those four arbitrary shapes? Oh. Probably they'll be put in a class of their own, the exceptions. Yes, of course. The major reason for the constant reprogramming are those exceptions that keep popping up. No, I have a better idea. They'll probably arrange them by color, and this way there will be no ambiguity. Tell you what, let's arrange them first by color, within color by shape, and within each subclass we'll arrange them by size. This way, everybody will be happy. Count on Lou to find an acceptable compromise. It's a marvelous idea. Now we can submit our findings in the form of tables and histograms. It'll be a very impressive report, especially if we use my new graphic package. Minimum 200 pages, guaranteed. <laughs> yes, an impressive, in-depth survey. You know, it's much worse than just wasting time producing useless, pompous reports. This over-concern about the proper way to arrange things manifests itself in other harmful ways. What do you mean? I mean, a merry-go-round that we're all too familiar with, arranging the company according to product lines and then changing it according to functional capabilities and vice versa, deciding that the company is wasting too much money on duplicated efforts and thus moving to a more centralized mode. Ten years later, we want to encourage entrepreneurship and we move back to decentralization. Almost every big company is oscillating every five to ten years from centralization to decentralization and then back again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a president of a company, when you don't know what to do, when things are not going well, you can always shuffle the cards, reorganize. That will do it. This reorganization will solve all our problems. We stare at each other. If it weren't so painfully true, we might laugh. Bob, this isn't funny. The only somewhat practical ideas I had in mind for what I should do as the new division manager were all based on reorganizing the division. No, oh, no. Okay, then. And I turned to the white board, which is not so white anymore. What is one supposed to do with this pile of colored shapes, except to arrange them in some order? Dealing directly with the pile is obviously totally impractical. Arranging the facts according to some order, classification must be the first step. Maybe we can proceed from there in a different way from writing reports or rearranging the company, but the first step definitely must be to put some order into the mess. As I continue to look at the board, a new question starts to bother me. In how many ways can one arrange the assembled facts? Obviously, we can arrange them by color. Or by size. Or by shape. Any other possibilities? Yes, of course. We can divide the board by an imaginary grid and arrange the shapes according to their coordinates. It'll give us the ability to construct many different arrangements based on the shape's relative position on the board. Oh, what a great idea. You know what? I'd rather use the dart technique. Throw a dart and start arranging the shapes according to the order in which we nail them. Look, all these methods have just as much meaning. At least my last suggestion offers some satisfaction. Okay, fellows. 
Bob's last suggestion has really clarified what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the fact that we haven't got any idea of what we're doing. If we're just looking for some arbitrary order, and we can choose among so many possibilities, then what's the point in putting so much effort in collecting so much data? What do we gain from it, except the ability to impress people with some thick reports, or to throw the company into another reorganization in order to hide the fact that we really don't understand what we're doing? This avenue of first collecting data, getting familiar with the facts, seems to lead us nowhere. It's nothing more than an exercise in futility. Come on, we need another way to attack the issue. Any suggestions? All right. Enough for today. We'll continue tomorrow, same time, same place. Chapter thirty-five. Well, anybody got anything good? Any breakthroughs? I try to start the meeting off as cheerfully as possible. It's not exactly how I feel. I spent the whole night tossing in my bed, searching for any opening, which I never did find. I think that I have one, not exactly a breakthrough, but wait, could... Ralph, interrupting. That's new. Before we go off on a different angle, I'd like to return to where we were yesterday. I think we were too hasty in our decision that classification of data can't lead to something good. May I?、Uh, sure. Well, as you know, or maybe you don't, I minored in chemistry in college. I don't know much about it, but one story stuck in my mind. Last night I looked back at my notes from class, and I think you'll find it interesting as well. It's a story about a remarkable Russian named Mendeleev, and it happened less than 150 years ago. Noticing that he's grabbed our attention, he becomes more confident. Ralph is a family man and has three little children, so he's probably used to telling stories. Right from the start, in the days of ancient Greece, people postulated that underlying the phenomenal variety of materials, there must be a simple set of elements from which all other substances are composed. The Greeks naively assumed that the elements were air, earth, water, and fire. Correct. What a wasted talent! He's a real storyteller. Who would have suspected it? Since then, as you know. People have proven that Earth is not a basic element, but actually composed of many different, more basic minerals. Air is composed of different types of gases, and even water is a composition of more basic elements: hydrogen and oxygen. The kiss of death to the naive Greek approach came at the end of the 18th century, when Lavoisier showed that fire is not a substance, but rather a process: the process of attachment to oxygen. Over many years, out of the chemist's mammoth work, the more basic elements emerged, and by the middle of the 19th century, 63 elements had been identified. The situation actually resembled our colored board: many circles, rectangles, stars, and other shapes, in many colors and sizes, filled the area with no apparent order—a real mess. Many tried to organize the elements, but no one succeeded in offering anything that was not immediately dismissed as a futile, arbitrary exercise. It got to the point that most chemists gave up on the possibility of finding any generic order, and concentrated their efforts on finding more hard facts regarding the combination of the elements to create other more complicated materials. Makes sense. I like practical people. Yes, Bob, but there was one professor who claimed that in his eyes it resembled dealing with the leaves, while nobody had yet found the trunk. Good point. So this peculiar Russian professor, who, by the way, taught in Paris. Decided to concentrate on revealing the underlying order governing the elements. Now, how would you go about it? Well, shape is out of the question. Why? What do you have against shapes? Out of the question. Some of the elements are gases. Some are liquids. Yeah, you're right. But what about color? You like colors, don't you? Some gases have colors, like green chlorine, and we can say that the others have、uh, transparent colors. Nice try. Unfortunately, some elements do not have a decisive color. Take pure carbon, for example. It appears as black graphite, or more rarely as a sparkling diamond. <laughs> I prefer diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> We all laugh then, responding to Ralph's gesture. I give it a try. We probably have to look for a more numerical measure. This way, we'll be able to arrange the elements without being criticized for subjective preferences. Very good. He's probably mistaken us for his kids. What do you suggest as a suitable measure? I didn't take chemistry, not even as a minor. How would I know? Maybe something like specific gravity, electrical conductivity, or something more fancy like 
the number of calories absorbed or released when the element is combining with a reference element like oxygen. Not bad, not bad at all. Mendeleev took basically the same approach. He chose to use a quantitative measurement that was known for each element and which didn't change as a function of the temperature or the state of the substance. It was the quantity known as atomic weight, which represents the ratio between the weight of one atom of the given element and the weight of one atom of the lightest element, hydrogen. This number provided Mendeleev with a unique numerical identifier for each element. A big deal. Exactly as I suspected, now he could organize all the elements according to their ascending atomic weights, like soldiers in a line. But what good does it do? What practical thing can possibly come out of it? Like I said, children playing with lead soldiers, pretending that uh, they do very important work. Not so fast. If Mendeleev had stopped here, I would accept your criticism. But he took it a step further. He didn't arrange the elements in a line. He had noticed that each seventh soldier represents basically the same chemical behavior, though with increased intensity. Thus, he organized the elements in a table with seven columns. In this way, all the elements were displayed according to ascending atomic weight, and in each column you find elements with the same chemical behavior and ascending intensity. For example, in the first column of his table stood lithium, which is the lightest of all metals, and which, when put into water, becomes warm. Right below it is sodium, which when put into water flames. Then the next one in the same column is potassium, which reacts even more violently to water. The last one is cesium, which flames even in regular air. Uh, very nice. But as I suspected, it's nothing more than child's play. What are the practical implications? There were practical ramifications. You see, when Mendeleev constructed his table, not all the elements were already found. This caused some holes in his table that he reacted to by inventing the appropriate missing elements. His classification gave him the ability to predict their weight and other properties. You must agree that's a real achievement. How was it accepted by the other scientists of his time? Inventing new elements must have been received with some skepticism. Skepticism is an understatement. Mendeleev became the laughingstock of the entire community, especially when his table was not as neatly arranged as I described it to you. Hydrogen was floating there above the table, not actually in any column, and some rows didn't have one element in their seventh column, but a hodgepodge of several elements crowded into one spot. So what happened at the end? Did his predictions come true? Yes, and with surprising accuracy. It took some years, but while he was still alive, all the elements that Mendeleev predicted were found. The last of the elements that he invented was found 16 years later. He had predicted it would be a dark gray metal. It was. He predicted that the atomic weight would be about 72. In reality, it was 72.32. Its specific gravity, he thought, would be about 5.5, and it was 5.47. I bet nobody laughed at him then. Certainly not. The attitude switched to admiration, and his periodic table is regarded by students of chemistry today as basic as the Ten Commandments. Well, I'm still not impressed. The biggest benefit was probably the fact that due to Mendeleev's table, people didn't have to waste time looking for more elements. You see, Bob, the classification helped in determining once and for all how many elements do exist. Putting any new element in the table would have upset the clear order. <laughs> um, sorry, Alex, but that's not the case. Yeah. Only ten years after the table was fully accepted, several new elements were discovered, the noble gases. It turned out that the table should have been constructed to have eight columns, not seven. Just as I've said, even when it works, you still can't trust it. Calm down, Bob. You must admit that Ralph's story has a lot of merit for us. I suggest that we ask ourselves, what's the difference between Mendeleev's classification of the chemical elements and our many attempts to arrange the colored shapes in order? Why was his so powerful and ours so arbitrary? That's just it. Ours were arbitrary and his was... Was what? Not arbitrary? No, forget it. That's not a serious answer. I'm just playing with what, words. Wait, what exactly do you mean by arbitrary and not arbitrary? Actually, what are we looking for? We're looking to arrange the facts in some order. What type of order are we seeking? An arbitrary order that we superimpose externally on the facts? Or are we trying to reveal an intrinsic order, an order that already exists there? You're absolutely right. Mendeleev definitely revealed an intrinsic order. He didn't reveal the reason for that order. That had to wait for another 50 years, when the internal structure of the atoms was found. But he definitely revealed the intrinsic order. That's why his classification was so powerful. Any other classification that just tries to superimpose some order, any order, on the given facts is useful in only one sense. 
It gives the ability to present the facts in a sequence, tables, or graphs. In other words, helpful in preparing useless thick reports. You see, we in our attempts to arrange the colored shapes didn't reveal any intrinsic order, simply because in that arbitrary collection there was no intrinsic order to be revealed. That's why all our attempts were arbitrary, all futile to the same extent. Yes, Ralph, but that doesn't mean that in other cases where intrinsic order does exist, like in managing a division, we can't fool ourselves in the same way. We can always procrastinate by wasting our time playing with some artificial external order. Let's face it, what do you think Alex and I would have done with the pile of facts that we suggested he gather? Judging by what we've done for so long here in the plant, probably just that, playing a lot of games with numbers and words. The question is, what are we going to do differently now? Anybody got an answer? If we could reveal the intrinsic order of the events in the division, that would certainly be of tremendous help. Yes, but how does one go about revealing the intrinsic order? How can one identify an intrinsic order even when he stumbles on it? Probably in order to answer this question, we should ask a more basic one. What provides the intrinsic order among various facts? Looking at the elements that Mendeleev had to deal with, they all seemed different. Some were metals and some gases, some yellow and some black. No two were identical. Yes, there were some that exhibited similarities, but that's also the case for the arbitrary shapes that Alex drew on the board. They continue to argue, but I'm not listening anymore. I'm stuck on Lou's question, how does one go about revealing the intrinsic order? He asked it as if it were a rhetorical question, as if the obvious answer is that it's impossible. But scientists do reveal the intrinsic order of things, and Jonah is a scientist. Suppose that it's possible. Suppose that a technique to reveal the intrinsic order does exist. Wouldn't such a technique be a powerful management tool? Without a doubt. But what's the point in daydreaming? And what happened to you today? I spent some time in the library. Do you know that Socrates didn't write anything? Socrates' dialogues actually were written by his pupil, Plato. The librarian here is a very pleasant woman. I like her a lot. Well, anyhow, she recommended some of the dialogues, and I've started to read them. You read philosophy? What for? Isn't it boring? You were talking about the Socratic method as a method to persuade other people. I wouldn't touch philosophy with a ten-foot pole. But to learn a method to persuade my stubborn husband and kids, for that I'm willing to sweat. So you started to read philosophy. <laughs> you make it sound like a punishment. Alex, did you ever read the dialogues of Socrates? No. They're not too bad. They're actually written like stories. They're quite interesting. How many have you read so far? Well, I'm still slaving on the first one, Protagoras. It'll be interesting to hear your opinion tomorrow. If it's still positive, maybe I'll read it, too. <laughs> yeah, when pigs fly. Let's hit the sack. Yeah, okay. Chapter 36 We're getting started a little late, since Stacy and Bob have to deal with some problematic orders. I wonder what's really happening. Are we drifting back into trouble? Is Stacy's warning about her capacity constraint resources starting to materialize? She was concerned about any increase in sales, and for sure, sales are slowly but constantly on the rise. I dismiss these thoughts. It's just the natural friction that should be expected when your material manager moves her responsibilities to her replacement. I decide not to interfere. If it evolves into something serious, they won't hesitate to tell me. This is not going to be easy. We are all action-oriented, and searching for basic procedures is almost against our nature, no matter how much Bob tells me that he's been transformed. So, when at last they all take seats, I remind them about the issue on the table. If we want the same movement that we've succeeded in starting here to happen in the entire division, we have to clarify for ourselves what we actually have done, in a generic sense. Repeating the specific actions won't work. Not only are the plants very different from each other, how can one fight local efficiencies in sales or cut batches in product design? Stacy is the only one who has something to offer, and her idea is simple. If Jonah forced us to start by asking, what is the goal of the company? Stacy suggests that we start by asking, what is our goal? Not as individuals, but as managers. We don't like it. It's too theoretical. Bob yawns and looks bored. Lou responds to my unspoken request and volunteers to play the game. 
This is trivial. If the goal of our company is to make more money now as well as in the future, then our job is to try and move our division to achieve that goal. Can you do it? If the goal includes the word more, can we achieve the goal? I see what you mean. No, of course we can't achieve a goal that is open ended. What we'll have to do is try and move the division toward that goal. And you are right, Stacy. It's not a one shot effort, and we have to constantly strive toward it. Let me rephrase my initial answer. A good job will be to start our division on a process of ongoing improvement. Alex, you asked for an idea of how to tackle the subject. I think that we should proceed from here. How? I don't know. I didn't claim to have a breakthrough, just an idea. Thank you, Stacy. We must admit that it is a different angle from the one we had so far. I point to the white board that nobody has bothered to erase yet. We are stuck. Donovan's question is certainly in place. So I try to gain some momentum by cleaning the board and writing in big letters a process of ongoing improvement. It doesn't help much. We sit in silence for a while, staring at the board. Comments? I'm sick and tired of these big words. Everywhere I go, I hear the same thing a process of ongoing improvement. Even if I wanted to forget it, I can't. Hilton Smythe's memos are all spotted with this phrase. By the way, Alex, these memos keep on coming, and more often than before, in the name of savings, at least saving paper. Can't you do something to stop it? In due time, but let's keep at it. If nothing comes out of these discussions, then the only useful thing that I'll be able to do as the division manager will be to stop some memos. Come on, Bob, spit out your frustrations. It doesn't take much to encourage Bob to voice his true opinion. Well, every plant in our company has already launched at least four or five of those pain in the neck improvement projects. If you ask me, they lead only to indigestion problems. You go down there to the floor and mention a new improvement project, and you'll see the response. People have already developed allergies to the phrase. So, what are you suggesting should be done? I pour some more fuel on his flames. To do what we've done here. We here have not done any of these. We have not launched even one formal improvement project. But look at what we've achieved. No talks, no big words, but if you ask me, what we've achieved here is the real thing. You're right. But, Bob, if we want to do the same in the entire division, we must pinpoint what exactly the difference is between what we have done and what everyone else has tried to do. Well, we haven't launched so many improvement projects. That is not accurate. We have taken many initiatives in shop floor procedures, in measurements, in quality, in local processes, not to mention the changes that we've made in the way we release material to production. True, we didn't call them improvement projects, but I don't believe the crucial difference is that we didn't bother to title them. So, why do you think we've succeeded where so many have failed? Simple. They talked, we did. Who's playing with words now? I think that the key. Is in the different way we interpreted the word improvement. What do you mean? She is absolutely right. It's all a matter of measurements. For an accountant, everything is a matter of measurements. Lou stands up and starts to pace the room. I rarely see him so excited. We wait. At last, he turns to the board and writes Throughput, inventory, operating expense. Everywhere, improvement was interpreted as almost synonymous to cost savings. People are concentrating on reducing operating expenses as if it's the most important measurement. Not even that. We were busy reducing costs that didn't have any impact on reducing operating expenses. Correct. But the important thing is that we, in our plant, have switched to regard throughput as the most important measurement. Improvement for us is not so much to reduce costs, but to increase throughput. You're right. The entire bottleneck concept is not geared to decrease operating expense. It's focused on increasing throughput. What you're telling us is that we've switched the scale of importance. That's precisely what it is. In the past, cost was the most important, throughput was second, and inventory was a remote third to the extent that we regarded it as assets. <laughs> yeah, right. Our new scale is different. Throughput is most important, then inventory, due to its impact on throughput, and only then at the tail comes operating expenses. And our numbers certainly confirm it. 
Throughput and inventory had changed by several tens of percent, while operating expenses went down by less than two percent. This is a very important lesson. What you claim is that we have moved from the cost world into the throughput world. You know what? It really highlights another problem. Changing the measurement scale of importance, moving from one world into another, is without a doubt a culture change. Let's face it, that's exactly what we had to go through. A culture change. But how are we going to take the division through such a change? You know, Alex, something is still missing. I have the feeling that the entire approach we took was different. In what way? I don't know. But one thing I can tell you, we haven't declared any improvement project. They grow from the need. Somehow, it was always obvious what the next step should be. I guess so. We spend good time. We bring up the actions we took and verify that each one actually has been guided by our new scale. Bob is very quiet until he jumps to his feet. I nailed the bastard. I have it. He goes to the board, grabs a marker, and puts a heavy circle around the word improvement. Process of ongoing improvement. Lou and his fixation on measurements forced us to concentrate on the last word. Don't you realize that the real sneaky sob is the first one? And he draws several circles around the word process. If Lou has a fixation about measurements, then you certainly have a fixation about processes. Let's hope that your fixation will turn up to be as useful as his. Sure thing, boss. I knew that the way we handled it was different. That it wasn't just a matter of scales. Do you care to elaborate? You haven't got it. Neither did we. <laughs> What is a process? We all know it is a sequence of steps to be followed. Correct? Yeah.、Mm -hmm. So, will anybody tell me what the process is that we should follow? What is the process mentioned in our process of ongoing improvement? Do you think that launching several improvement projects is a process? We haven't done that. We have followed a process. That's what we have done. He's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What process have we followed? I don't know, but we definitely followed a process. Let's find it. If we followed it, it shouldn't be too difficult to find. Let's think. What is the first thing we did? You know, these two things are connected. What things? In the cost world, as Alex called it, we're concerned primarily with cost. Cost is drained everywhere. Everything costs us money. We had viewed our complex organization as if it were composed out of many links, and each link is important to control. Would you please get to the point? Let him talk. It's like measuring a chain according to its weight. Every link is important. Of course, if the links are very different from each other, then we use the principle of the twenty-eighty rule. Twenty percent of the variables are responsible for eighty percent of the result. The mere fact that we all know the Pareto principle shows us to what extent Lou was right. The extent to which we all were in the cost world. We recognize that the scale has to be changed. We choose throughput as the most important measurement. Where do we achieve throughput? At each link? No, only at the end of all operations. You see, Bob, deciding that throughput is number one is like changing from considering weight to considering strength. I don't see a thing. Well, what determines the strength of a chain? The weakest link, wise guy. So, if you want to improve the strength of the chain, what must your first step be? To find the weakest link. To identify the bottleneck. Hey, that's it! What a guy! <laughs> Ralph looks a little bent, but he is glowing. As a matter of fact, we all are. After that, it was easy, relatively easy. It wasn't too long before the process was written clearly on the board. Step one: identify the system's bottlenecks. After all, it wasn't too difficult to identify the oven and the NCX10 as the bottlenecks of the plant. Step two. Decide how to exploit the bottlenecks. That was fun. Realizing that those machines should not take a lunch break, etc. Step three: subordinate everything else to the above decision, making sure that everything marches to the tune of the constraints, the red and green tags. Step four: elevate the system's bottlenecks, bringing back the old magma, switching back to old, less effective routings. Step five. If in a previous step a bottleneck has broken, go back to step one. I look at the board; it's so simple, plain common sense. I'm wondering, and not for the first time, how come we didn't see it before? Bob is right. We certainly followed this process, and we cycled through it more than once. 
Even the nature of the bottlenecks we had to deal with changed. What do you mean by the nature of the bottlenecks? I mean a major change. You know, something serious like the bottleneck changing from being a machine to being something totally different, like insufficient market demand. Each time that we've gone through this five-step cycle, the nature of the bottleneck has changed. First, the bottlenecks were the oven and the NCX10. Then it was the material release system. Remember the last time when Jonah was here? Then it was the market, and I'm afraid that very soon it'll be back in production. You're right. It's a little odd to call the market or the system of material release a bottleneck. Why don't we change the word to constraint? We correct it on the board. Then we just sit there admiring our work. What am I going to do to continue the momentum? <laughs> Never satisfied, huh? Alex, why do you drive yourself so hard? Aren't the five steps that you developed enough of an achievement for one day? Of course, it's enough. It's more than enough. Finding the process that everybody's looking for, the way to proceed systematically on the line of ongoing improvement, is quite an achievement. But Julie. I'm talking about something else. How can we continue to improve the plant rapidly? What's the problem? It seems that everything is sailing forward quite smoothly. <sighs> Not exactly, Julie. I can't push aggressively for more orders because we're afraid that any additional sales will create more bottlenecks and throw us back into the nightmare of expediting. On the other hand, I can't ask for a major expansion in hiring or machines. The existing bottom line results don't justify it yet. <laughs> My impatient husband, it looks like you simply have to sit tight and wait until the plant generates enough money to justify more investments. In any event, darling, very shortly it will be Donovan's headache. It's about time you allowed others to worry. Maybe you're right. Chapter Thirty Seven. Something is wrong. Something is still missing. What? Bob is all geared up to protect our new creation. If Step Three is right, if we have to subordinate everything to the decision that we made on the constraint, oh then... come on, Ralph! What's all this? If we have to subordinate, is there any doubt that we must subordinate the non-constraints to the constraints? What are the schedules that you generate on your computers, if not the act of subordinating everything to our decision about the bottleneck's work? I don't doubt that, but when the nature of the constraint has changed, one would expect to see a major change in the way we operate all non-constraints. That makes sense. So, what is bothering you? Well, I don't recall that we did such changes.、Oh. Hey, he's right. I don't recall it either. We didn't. Maybe we should have. Let's examine it. When was the first time the constraint changed? It happened when some green tag parts started arriving at assembly too late. Remember our fear that new bottlenecks were popping up? Yes, and then Jonah came and showed us it wasn't new bottlenecks, but that the constraint had shifted to being the way we released work to the plant. Yeah, I still remember the shock of restricting the release of material, even though the people had practically nothing else to work on. And our fear that efficiencies would drop. In retrospect, I'm amazed that we had the courage to do it. We did it because it made perfect sense. Reality certainly proved us right. So, Ralph, in that case at least, we did affect all the non-constraints. Should we move on? Ralph doesn't answer. Something still troubling you? Yes, but I can't put my finger on it. What's the problem, Ralph? You, Bob, and I generated the work list for the constraints. Then you made the computer generate release dates for all material based on that list. We definitely changed the way we operated a non-constraint. That is, if we consider the computer as a non-constraint. <laughs> Then, I made my people obey those computer lists. That was a major change in the way they operate, especially when you consider how much pressure the foreman put on them to supply them with work. But you must admit the biggest change was on the shop floor. It was very difficult for most people to swallow that we really meant they shouldn't work all the time. Don't forget that the fear of layoffs was hanging heavily above us. I guess it's all right. What did we do with the method we were using? You know the green and red tags. Nothing. Why should we do anything about it? Thank you, Lou. That's exactly what was bothering me. 
Stacy, do you remember the reason for using those tags in the first place? We wanted to establish clear priorities. We wanted each worker to know what is important and must be worked on immediately, and what is less important. That's right. That's exactly why we did it. Oh, I see what you mean. Now, not like in the past when we release stuff just to provide work. Now, whatever we release to the floor is basically of the same importance. Let me think for a minute. Oh shit! What's the matter? I just realized the impact that those darn tags have on our operation. Well. Ah,、oh, I'm embarrassed. I've been complaining about our problems with the six or seven capacity constraint resources. I raised all the red flags. I've gone as far as to demand that incoming orders be restricted, and now I see that I've created the problem with my own hands. Feel us in, Stacy. You're way ahead of us. Of course, you see. When do the green and red tags have an impact? Only when a work center has a queue, when the worker has to choose between two different jobs that are waiting. Then he always works on the red tag first. So, the largest queues are in front of the bottlenecks, but there the tags are irrelevant. The other place where we have relatively high queues is in front of the capacity constraint resources. These resources supply some parts to the bottlenecks, red tag parts, but they work on many more green tag parts, parts that go to assembly, not through the bottlenecks. Today they do the red tag parts first. This naturally delays the arrival of the green parts to assembly. We catch it when it's pretty late, when holes are already evident in the assembly buffer. Then and only then. We go and change the priorities at those work centers. Basically, we restore the importance of the green parts. So, what you're telling us is that if you just eliminate the tags, it'll be much better. Yes, that's what I'm saying. If we eliminate the tags and we instruct the workers to work according to the sequence in which the parts arrive, first come, first done, the parts will be done in the right sequence. Fewer holes will be created in the buffers. My people will not have to track where the material is stuck, and, and the foreman will not have to constantly reshuffle priorities. Stacy, are you positive that your warning about those constraint resources was just a false alarm? Can we safely take more orders? I think so. It explains one of my biggest mysteries: why there are so few holes in the bottleneck's buffers, while there are more and more in the assembly buffer. By the way, fellows, the fact that there are more and more holes indicates that eventually we will run into the problem of insufficient capacity, but not right now. I'll take care of those tags immediately. You won't see them tomorrow. Well, this discussion was very beneficial. Let's carry on. When was the second constraint broken? When we started shipping everything much ahead of time. Shipping three weeks earlier is a clear indication that the constraint is no longer in production, but it's in the market. Lack of sufficient orders limited the plant from making more money. Correct. What do you think? Did we do anything different on the non-constraints? Not me. Me neither. Hey, wait a minute. How come we continue to release material according to the oven and the NCX10 if they're no longer the constraints? We look at each other. Really? How come? Something even funnier is going on. How come my computer shows that these two work centers are still a constraint, that they are constantly loaded to 100 percent? Stacy. Do you know what's going on? I'm afraid I do. It's definitely not my day. In all this time, I wondered why our finished goods were not depleting at a faster rate. Hey, well, why don't you tell us what's going on? Go ahead, Stacy. Come on, fellows, don't look at me like that. After operating for so long with mountains of finished goods, wouldn't anybody do the same? Do what? Will you please stop talking in riddles? We all knew how important it was to make the bottlenecks work all the time. Remember, an hour lost on the bottleneck is an hour lost for the entire plant. So when I realized that the load on the bottlenecks was dropping, I issued orders for products to be on the shelf in stock. Stupid, I know now, but at least at the moment our finished goods are balanced to roughly six weeks. No more of that awful situation where we hold mountains of some products and not even one single unit of others. That's good. It means we can easily deplete it. Alex, be careful not to do it too fast. Remember the bottom line ramifications. Why shouldn't we get rid of the finished products as fast as possible? Never mind. 
Lou can and should explain it to all of you later. Right now, we should correct our five-step process. Now, we all know to what extent Ralph was right. Something is definitely missing. Can I correct it? Stacy goes to the board. When she returns to her seat, the board has the following. One, identify the system's constraints. Two, decide how to exploit the system's constraints. Three, subordinate everything else to the above decision. Four, elevate the system's constraints. Five, warning. If in the previous steps a constraint has been broken, go back to step one, but do not allow inertia to cause a system's constraint. Oh, it's much worse than I thought. On the contrary, it's much better than I thought. You first. Why do you claim that it's much worse? Because I've lost my only guideline. All the changes that we made so far, all the sacred cows that we had to slaughter, had one thing in common: they all stem from cost accounting. Local efficiencies, optimum batch sizes, product cost, inventory evaluations, all came from the same source. I didn't have much problem with it. As a controller, I questioned cost accounting validity for a long time. Remember, it's an invention from the beginning of the century when conditions were much different from today. As a matter of fact, I started to have a very good guideline. If it comes from cost accounting, it must be wrong. Very good guideline, but what's your problem? Don't you see? The problem is much bigger. It's not only cost accounting. We put on the green and red tags not because of cost accounting, but because we realize the importance of the bottlenecks. Stacy created orders for finished goods because of our new understanding, because she wanted to make sure that the bottlenecks capacity will not be wasted. I thought that it takes a lot of time to develop inertia. What I see now is that it takes less than one month. Yes, you are right. Whenever the constraint is broken, it changes conditions to the extent that it's very dangerous to extrapolate from the past. As a matter of fact, even the things that we put in place in order to elevate the constraint must be re-examined. Well, how can we do it? I, it's impossible to question everything every time. Something is still missing. Something is definitely still missing. Alex, it's your turn to explain. Explain what? Why did you claim that it's much better? It's about time for some good news. Fellows, what stopped us from once again taking another jump on the bottom line? Nothing, except for the conviction that we don't have enough capacity. Well, now we know differently. Now we know that we have a lot of spare capacity. How much spare capacity do we actually have? Stacy, how much of the current load on the oven in the NCX10 is due to the fictitious orders? Roughly 20 percent. Marvelous! We have enough capacity to really take the market. I'd better drive to headquarters tomorrow morning and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Johnny Johns. Lou, I'll definitely need you. On second thought, Ralph, will you join us and bring your computer with you? We're going to show them something. Chapter 38. It's six o'clock in the morning when I pick up Lou and Ralph at the plant. We, I, decided that it will be best. Since picking them up at their houses would mean I would have had to leave home close to five. In any event, we're probably not going to spend more than a few hours at headquarters, so it's reasonable to assume that we'll be back at work in the afternoon. We hardly talk. Ralph, in the back seat, is busy with his laptop computer. Lou probably thinks that he's still in bed. I drive on automatic pilot. That is to say that my mind is busy constructing imaginary conversations with Johnny Johns. I somehow have to convince him to get many more orders for our plant. Yesterday, in the heat of discovering the amount of free capacity that we have, I looked only on the bright side. Now I wonder if I'm not just asking for miracles. I recheck the numbers in my head. In order to fill our capacity, Johnny will have to come up with over ten million dollars of additional sales. It's totally unrealistic that he holds so much up his sleeve. So squeezing, begging, and pleading techniques will not help. We'll have to come up with some innovative ideas. Well, the truth is that so far I haven't been able to come up with any. Let's hope Johnny has some clever ideas. He's the one who's supposed to be the expert in sales. I want you to meet Dick Paskey. He's one of my best people. Dedicated, professional, above all, he's full of innovative approaches. I thought it would be a good idea for you to get to know him. Do you mind if he joins us? On the contrary, we need some innovative ideas. You see. 
What I want is for you to get my plant additional business. Ten million dollars worth. <laughs> jokers. All of you in production are wonderful jokers. Dick, what did I tell you? It's not easy to deal with plant managers. One is asking me to persuade his client to pay a 10% increase in price. Another wants me to get rid of a pile of old junk for full price. But Alex, you're the best. Ten million dollars. <laughs> Johnny, put on your thinking cap. You must find more orders for my plant. Ten million dollars more. You are serious. Alex, what's happened to you? You know how tough it is to get more business these days. It's doggy dog out there. Everybody is cutting each other's throats for the smallest order, and you're talking about ten million dollars more? I don't hurry to respond. I lean back in my seat and look at him. Listen, Johnny, you know that my plant has improved. What you don't know is to what extent it's improved. We're now capable of delivering everything within two weeks. We've demonstrated that we never miss an order, not even by one day. Our quality has improved to the extent that I'm sure we're the best in the market. We're very responsive, very quick, and above all, very reliable. This isn't a sales pitch. It's the truth. Alex, I know all this. I hear it from the best source, from my clients. But that doesn't mean that I can immediately turn it into cash. Sales take time. Credibility is not built overnight. It's a gradual process. And by the way, you shouldn't complain. I'm bringing you more and more sales. Be patient and don't press for miracles. I have twenty percent spare capacity. From the lack of response, I understand that Johnny doesn't see the relevance. I need twenty percent more sales. Alex, orders are not apples hanging from trees. I can't just go out and pick some for you. There must be some orders that you decline because the quality requirement is too high, or because the client is asking for unreasonably short delivery times, or something. Get me those orders. You probably don't know how deep the recession is. Today, I accept any order, anything that moves. I know that a lot of dancing will be required later, but the current pressure is simply too high. If the competition is so fierce and the recession is so deep. Then it must be that clients are pressing for lower prices. Pressing is not the word. Squeezing is more appropriate. Can you imagine? And and this is just between us. In some cases, I'm forced to accept business for practically zero margin. I start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Johnny, do they sometimes demand prices that are lower than our cost? <laughs> sometimes, all the time. And what do you do? What can I do? I try to explain the best I can. Sometimes it even works. I'm ready to accept orders for ten percent below cost. Johnny doesn't hurry to answer. His people's bonuses are based on total sales dollars. Forget it. Why? Why should I forget it? Because it's stupid. Because it doesn't make any business sense. Alex. I don't know what tricks you have in mind, but let me tell you, all those tricks have a very short lifespan before they explode in your face. Why do you want to ruin a promising career? You've done an outstanding job. Why go and mess it up? Besides, if we lower prices for one client, it's just a matter of time until the others find out and demand the same. What then? He has a point. The last argument shows that the light at the end of the tunnel was just a train. Help comes from an unexpected side. Jean Glay is not connected to our regular customers. Besides, with the quantities he's asking for, we can always claim we gave him a volume discount. Forget it. That bastard is asking us to give him the goods for basically nothing. Not to mention he wants us to ship to France at our expense. This French guy has chutzpah. It's unbelievable. We negotiated for three months. We established each other's credibility. We agreed on terms and conditions. It all takes time. He asked for every technical detail that you can imagine, and we're not talking about one or two products. It's for almost the entire range. All this time, not even a peep about prices. At the end, just two days ago, when everything is agreed, he faxes me that our prices are not acceptable and sends us his counteroffer. I was expecting the usual thing, asking for price reductions of ten percent, maybe fifteen percent, considering the large quantities that he's willing to buy. But no. These Europeans probably have a different perception. For example, Model 12, the one you pulled such a miracle on, our price is $992. We sell it to Burnside's for $827. They're a big client, and they consume very large quantities of this particular product. The bastard had the nerve to offer $701. Did you hear that? $701. Now you understand. What's our material cost for Model 12? 
$334.07. Johnny, are you sure that accepting this order will not have any impact on our domestic clients? Well, not unless we go out and sing it from the rooftops. On this point, Dick is right. No impact. But the whole idea is ridiculous. Why are we wasting our time? I look at Lou. He nods. We'll take it. Johnny doesn't respond. We'll take it. Can you explain what's going on? It's very simple. I told you that I have spare capacity. If we take this order, the only out-of-pocket cost to produce these products will be the cost of the materials. We'll get $701, and we'll pay $334. That's $378 to the bottom line per unit. It's $366.93 per unit, and you forgot the freight. Thank you. How much is the air freight per unit? I don't remember, but it's not more than 30 bucks. Can we see the details of that deal? What I'm particularly interested in is the products, the quantities per month, and the prices. Johnny gives me a long look and then turns to Dick. Bring it. I don't get it. You want to sell in Europe for a price that is much less than we get here, even less than the production cost, and you still claim that you'll make a lot of money? Lou, you're a controller. Does it make sense to you? Yes. Seeing the miserable expression on Johnny's face, I jump in before Lou has a chance to explain. Financial calculations showing the fallacy of the product-cost concept won't help. It will just confuse Johnny even more than he's confused now. I decide to approach it from another angle. Johnny, where do you prefer to buy a Japanese camera? In Tokyo or in Manhattan? In Manhattan, of course. Why? Because in Manhattan it's cheaper. Everybody knows that. Well, I know a place on 47th Street where you can get a real bargain. Half price compared to what they asked me to pay for it in Tokyo. Why do you think it's cheaper in Manhattan? Ah, we know. Transportation prices must be negative. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alex, you've convinced me. I still don't understand, but if it's good for the Japanese, it must be profitable. We work on the numbers for almost three hours. It's a good thing that I brought both Ralph and Lou. We calculate the load that this large deal will place on the bottlenecks. No problem. We check the impact on each of the seven problematic work centers. Two might reach the dangerous zone, but we can manage. Then we calculate the financial impact. Impressive. Very impressive. At last, we're ready. Johnny, I have one more question. What guarantees that the European manufacturers won't start a price war? What do you care? With such ridiculous prices, I'm going to lock in Monsieur Jangleur for at least another year. Not good enough. Now you're really getting difficult. I knew this was too good to be true. That's not the point, Johnny. I want to use this deal as a beachhead to penetrate Europe. We can't afford a price war. We must come up with something else beside price, something that will make it very difficult to compete with us. Tell me, what's the average supply time in Europe? About the same as here, eight to twelve weeks. Good. Promise your monsieur that if he commits to the quantities per year, we'll deliver any reasonable quantity within three weeks of receiving his fax. Are you serious? Dead serious. And by the way, I can start to deliver immediately. I have whatever's needed for the first shipment in stock. I guess it's your neck. What the heck, in any event, you will have full responsibility very shortly. If I don't hear from you, I'll fax him tomorrow. Consider it a done deal. Only after we pull out of the parking lot do we let ourselves go. It takes us more than 15 minutes to settle down. That is, Lou and Ralph dive into polishing the numbers. From time to time, they come up with a slight correction, usually not more than a few hundred dollars. Compared to the total deal, it's not significant at all, but Lou finds it relaxing. I don't let it bother me. I sing at the top of my voice. It takes us more than half the way home until they're satisfied. Lou announces the final number. The contribution to the net profit of the plant is an impressive seven digits, a fact that doesn't deter him from specifying it down to the last cent. Quite a profitable deal, and to think that Johnny was about to drop it. What a strange world. One thing for sure, you can't rely on marketing people to solve the marketing problems. They're captured by old, devastating common practices to an even larger extent than production. Try to imagine the reaction of people when I start to explain to them they are the ones who believe too much in cost accounting. Yes. Judging from today, I shouldn't expect much help from these guys, even though, you know, there might be something in Dick. Hard to tell, especially when Johnny is holding him so tightly under his thumb. 
Alex, how are you going to do it? Do what? Change the entire division. That puts an end to my euphoria. Damn you, Lou. Why do you have to bring it up? God have mercy on me. Yesterday, we were talking about inertia. We were complaining about the inertia that we have. Compare it to the inertia that we're going to face in the division. Oh, oh boy. This week, even though we made such impressive progress, one thing was definitely proven. I'm still managing by the seat of my pants. Take yesterday, for example. If it weren't for Ralph's instinct that something was missing, we wouldn't even have noticed the huge open opportunities. Or today, how close was I to giving up? If it hadn't been for Lou putting us on the right track, I must find out just what are the management techniques I should master. It's simply too risky not to. I must concentrate on it. I even know where to begin. Maybe I was holding the key all along. What did I say to Julie in the restaurant? My own words echo in my head. When did Jonah have the time to learn so much? As far as I know, he never worked one day of his life in.